boys. So glad you're here. Uh, before I get too far into the message, uh, we have to say happy birthday to Matt Schmitz. Matt, was, he was playing drums this morning on his birthday. Uh, if you noticed a little more pep in his step on the drums, he's the birthday boy. Um, happy birthday, man. Thanks for serving on your birthday. He's a, a teacher in Santa Maria, and his wife, Summer, works for Coastal Christian School, and is, she's serving in kids today, also serves, serves on a worship team. Uh, just an exemplary family, and we're just so thankful that you guys are uh, have called Equippers your home. We love you. Happy. Uh, also, uh, Annalise, I just heard that you were here. Annalise Ketz, are you around somewhere? Where are you? Stand up. Can we welcome Annalise Ketz? Um, Annalise is uh, active duty in the Navy and uh, somehow, some way, blessed us with her presence this morning to be here. And so uh, thank you for your service and uh, thank you for, for, we just love you. You're an amazing part of this family, this community. Um, she serves on, on submarines. Um, this is worth your time getting to know Annalise. It's absolutely incredible what she does. And uh, it'll make you feel a little bit safer, too, uh, living in the United States, knowing that she's out there on a submarine uh, beating other bad guys to the punch. You could say it that way. Uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is John Sparrow. I uh, serve as lead pastor here. Uh, married to my wife, Lene, uh, which she was just right there. She, um, but we, we, <laughs> she's carrying a little baby, Callum, our youngest. He'll be two in October. And then we have Davey, who's four years old, uh, Lily, who's six, Paisley, who is six, going on 13. Um, I don't know if you saw her today, but she got bangs this week. And uh, Rena gave her bangs, and uh, I hate it because she looks like she's like a teenager. Anyways, enough about me. We're going to go to the Bible. We're going to read the Bible. <laughs> And uh, if, if you're new to this uh, sort of experience, church, uh, thanks for coming. It's really brave of you to get into a room full of crazy people like this and uh, worship together, listen to the Bible. Um, but I'm going to read some scripture. I'm going to teach about it. And the hope is that you don't just receive information, but somehow you receive revelation uh, about the truth of who God is and who you are in relation to him. And uh, so let's go. Uh, if you have your Bible, we're continuing on in 2 Timothy uh, 1 uh, through 7, 2, 1 through 7. He says this, this is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift that it is, and we submit to it now, and we offer you first position to shape our worldview, to shape what we define as truth, and how we're being shaped into that truth. And right now, we ask Holy Spirit that you would come as teacher and as guide. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We'll never stop, we'll never get over how good you are, how faithful you are, how consistent you've been, and will always be. So, God, we ask that you would anoint your word today. May it bring transformation in Jesus' name. I pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 starts off like this. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And just to recap a little bit, um, this isn't biologically Paul's son. This is who, someone who's come along to be a spiritual son of Timothy in the faith. And Paul, this is the last letter that he'll write. This is... This is the last words before he dies. And like we've been talking about the last few weeks, there's just not that it has a greater weight. It just you lean in a little bit more when you know like this is the last thing that someone might say. And so Paul is instructing Timothy how he might take the reins of the gospel as Paul departs. Timothy's young. He's leading a church that some would say is around 20,000 people in the city of Ephesus, who is, it's a secular hub. It's a, it's a place that's filled with sensual activity and false idols and gods. And he's instructing 
Timothy how to be strong in a culture like Ephesus. And, and, and the word uh, that Paul is using here is for him to be strong in the grace. And like we talked about, the, the title of the series that we're in is called Fit for This because I, I, I'm just sick and tired of Christians walking around condemned. Uh, the word condemned means not fit for use. And the Bible says very clearly in John 3, 17, right after our favorite verse, John 3, 16, that Jesus didn't come in the world to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. He didn't come to tell you that you're not fit for use. He came to save you, redeem you, restore you, and establish you as someone who might be like Timothy to carry on the gospel message. And, and so that's why we, we love this idea of fit for this. Someone turn to the person next to you and say, you're fit for this. You're fit for this, um, but I also be, want to be very clear that you're becoming fit for this. And to recap a few biblical definitions, um, uh, justification, if you haven't heard this word, justification means that you have been saved. Uh, when you, in your heart, confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you confess with your lips and you believe in your heart, like the Bible says, you, you've been justified, there's God's a judge, which is really good news. This isn't something to be scared of. God is a judge. And when you make that decision to confess him as Lord, he makes a judgment on your behalf that you are made righteous, which is a really good thing. That's a really good deal. You did nothing. You deserve nothing. You actually did all the wrong things. Romans 5 said that you were an enemy to God. You were no use to him. But the moment your heart is turned towards him and you repent of your sin, he makes a judgment on your behalf that you've been made righteous. So you've been justified. That's really good news. And but then this word sanctification. So you have been saved, but how I many that now that you've been saved, you're on a journey of being saved. He's restoring you. He's healing you. He's, uh, his ultimate intention and goal with you is to form you into a little Christ, a little Jesus, uh, which I'll talk about just in a few minutes. But you are made, being made into the image of his son, Jesus. And then glorification, this whole thing's going to be okay. All right? Like you will be saved. Uh, there is a day coming when he'll wipe away every tear, when God's going to set all the wrong things right. There will be a day when you are glorified and you are with him in eternity and he's going to establish his rule and reign on the earth to uh, 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 establish himself as king. And so that's the glorification. You will be saved. Cool? You came to school today? You taking notes? Because uh, there's extra credit for notes. No, not pizza. Heavenly reward. Um, and so this, this series is very much uh, about sanctification. It's this idea that we've been made fit because of what Jesus has done, but we're being made fit through what Jesus wants to do in our, in our lives and through our lives. And so we're going to pick up uh, back here in 2 Timothy 2, 2. Uh, Paul says, the things you've heard me say uh, in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people. Someone say Reliable. Reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. And so the, the daunting thought or the, the scary thing, uh, if you can let the fear of God come for just a moment, is that Paul's instructing Timothy on how he might establish leaders in the church of Ephesus. How he might entrust people with this life-changing, reconciling message of Jesus. And basically what we can gather from this is, would Timothy come and tap me on the shoulder and be like, hey, you want to be part of my team? Is, that, is there some way that I'm being made fit? Is there some way that I'm being made qualified that I might fit into this category of a reliable person? And how about you, but as a Cooper's church, I want to be reliable people. I want to be the type that God might trust with the move of his Holy Spirit. I, I want to be one who he might trust to actually teach other people and so that's the emphasis of this series. We're, we're being made fit. And so if Timothy was going around like, hey, do you want to join with me in the reconciling work of Jesus to overthrow the, uh, the princess god of uh, Diana? I've never heard it like Princess Diana. Rest in peace. <laughs> That was Diana. That was the god of Ephesus who had a temple in the middle who uh, established herself as the sensual one who was full of lust and lesser loves. Like, do you want to be part of overthrowing that thing to establish God's kingdom? I don't know about you, but that'd be awesome to be tapped on the shoulder. And, hey, you want to grab coffee and just see how we might do this thing together? Because you seem reliable. I don't know about you, but I have my heart set on being a part of what God wants to do, not just a spectator on the bench. And so we talked about the soldier 
A soldier works to please the commanding officer. The athlete, you need to go back and listen to last week if you haven't heard it. Uh, we got flagged by the Olympic Committee, uh, but it's back online. Isn't that funny? Like Little Equippers Church in Arroyo Grande, like they flagged us and they took our YouTube video down, but we're back online. It was that good, man. They're intimidated. <laughs> like, man, that place produces some athletes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. I had an Olympic clip in there, and they're, they're pretty good at fishing that stuff out. Um, but we're gonna, today we're going to talk about the farmer. The hardworking farmer should be the first to re- receive a share of the crops. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. And Paul, who's writing this, knew exactly what it meant to work hard. He knew what it was like to endure hardship. By the time that Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, he had endured unspeakable things. He had faced persecution. If if you just read throughout the book of Acts of what happened after Saul was turned into Paul and the persecution that he repeatedly faced and he's shipwrecked and he's washed up on the Isle of Malta and a, a, a snake bites him. I mean, the stuff that Paul had endured to get to this point, there's a little bit of weight when he says the words hardworking. Uh, he, he knew what it was like to work tirelessly for the gospel. He knew what it was like to trust in God's promises even when the harvest wasn't even in sight yet. And by the time he's writing this, he had suffered so much. And if you keep reading 2 Timothy 2, he said that he is now in chains for this gospel. So there's some weight. And what I, what I want to emphasize, N.T. Wright says it so well. He says the point here is clear. Beware of the temptation to engage in the Christian life like a kind of absentee landlord. Expecting the benefits without having to do any of the hard work. By the same token, if you want rewards, get on with the work. If you want rewards, get on with the work. And I know this can be challenging for our, you know, our charismatic grace message. We're grace people. We love the grace of God. We believe in the grace of God. But we also know our Bibles that you have been created as a masterpiece of God for good works. And so is it grace or is it works? The answer will always be yes. It's not either or, it's a both and. Do you want cake or ice cream? Yes. So if you want rewards, there's actually something here tied to a hardworking farmer that has certain privileges above a not hardworking farmer. And this can be challenging for a Christian mind to understand because we are all the product of grace, but I believe that God actually wants to invite us into sharing in the crop. Amen? Sharing in the crop. And I was talking to a friend yesterday and recently, the Lord has really started to stir his heart. Uh, this is one of my best friends, and I've just always been so inspired by his life. But right now, there's just something happening on the inside of him. And, and we're hanging out, and he used this term like, I, I just don't want to miss whatever it is God's doing. There was this genuine purity in his soul. I just don't want to miss whatever it is God is doing. And, and he said this, if there's a wave coming, I'm starting to paddle. And this looked like for him growing in prayer. It was his goal this year. His birthday was recently. And his goal wasn't just to own a house. It wasn't just to you know, set his sights on something. Those are, those are good pursuits. He said, I want to grow in prayer. Because if there's a wave coming, I, I want to catch it. And him and his wife have recently started fasting together once a week. They're, they're, they are positioning stuff. And they're doing the Christian work that positions a Christian for a harvest. And if, if you're looking to grow, I, I always want to offer resources. And this is what I'm currently reading. Uh, it's called uh, Catching Fire, Becoming Flame by Albert Haas. It was required reading for a cohort that I'm a part of. But it'll absolutely change your life. Uh, it, and it's just important right now uh, that you don't become a bystander, but you actually let God get a hold of your life. And a lot of the work looks like that. Prayer, fasting, and positioning ourselves for him. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Who who believes that the Bible is true? He rewards those who earnestly seek him. We're going to talk a little bit about what that reward actually is. But um, I just wonder if there's any uh, control freaks in the house. I had a friend recently tell me that he doesn't have a problem with control, in which I said you must have a problem with lying. I love control. I am a control freak at its finest. Uh, I, I just remember like at 
you know, premeditating my future and having all of the I's dotted and the T's crossed. I mean, I, I had this vision for exactly what life would look like. I don't know if you can relate or agree. We, we love the idea of having a sense of control of outcomes. We, we love the things that we can see from start to finish with our eyes that are a little bit predictable. You know, we want a ton of reward without a ton of risk. We, we like the idea of control. And I, I, what I've learned is, and what I've struggled through is that my life right now looks nothing like the way I envisioned it. I've yet to know someone other than my sister, Brianna, who knew she was going to be a nurse when she was like six years old. Now she's a nurse practitioner of the number one transplant team in the nation. Like, okay, we get it. Um, Most other people, where you are sitting right now and the people you're sitting next to and the environment that God has you in is, is so different, I'd imagine, that we thought ahead of time. And What I've realized is that there are so many variables in life that I have zero control of. There's just outcomes that are going to be according to the sovereign grace of my God. But there are a whole lot of things that I do control that I'd love to be a better steward of. And so we live in this constant tension of controlling the things we can and trusting God with the things that we can't. And this is an incredible slow process of dying to our expectation because I believe at some sense we all like an element of control. This is the original sin. Adam and Eve, they, they wanted to be like God, didn't they? So they chose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? So that they could have a little bit of a control with their outcome. But the reality is, is that we're reading a passage of scripture right now that has to do with farmers. And if you've ever walked with farmers or known farmers, there's nothing scarier in my mind than being a farmer because of the lack of control. Farmers, if you don't know, they work with seeds and seasons. It's crazy. I I, I don't know how crazy you must have to be that you you bank your whole life on preparing the ground, uh, uh, of finding the right location and temperature and hopeful outcome and and you take a small seed and you plant that seed in the ground and you, you cover that thing up and you just hope it works out. That seems crazy to me. <laughs> I, I like way more sense of control. And, but the reality is I want to reinforce this truth that in that seed that a farmer is planting, everything is already in the seed that's needed to become a crop. There's just a process. Everything, that that seed is already a tree. That seed is already a plant. It it already has everything it needs. It just needs some time, some water, and the right environment to become the thing that it's intended to be. And so it is with us. God has put so much in us to to see his finished work in us, but there's just a process. And the reality is is that there's good news because there's reward for the hard work of waiting. There's there's the season of harvest to come and all that. But the bad news is you just have to wait for it. But I want to encourage you, Jacob waited until he was 130 years old, but then suddenly the salvation of the Lord visited him. Joseph waited in prison for about 10 years, but when it was time for him to be released, he rose in one day from the prison to a palace. Moses waited for 40 years in Midian, but then suddenly God released him to lead the nation of Israel. Naomi waited on God after the devastating loss of her husband and sons, but then God suddenly brought redemption to her life. David waited in exile for about 10 years, then God gave him a kingdom. Hezekiah cried out to God and waited for his deliverance. When God finally sent his angel, get this, 185,000 Assyrians were killed in one night. Anna waited on God in fasting and prayer in the temple for close to 60 years, and then suddenly she held in her arms the answer to her intercession in the person of Jesus. So the reality is, is that there will be a reward, but part of the hard work of a farmer is being patient in the meantime. It's to wait expectantly, knowing that he who promised is faithful. The other thing that uh, farmers have to deal with, they deal with seed, but then they deal with seasons. I don't know the last time you just read through Ecclesiastes, but there's some wisdom here. Solomon says that there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. And a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent 
and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. The reality is, is that there are seasons and rhythms to your life that are worth taking note of. And, and this, this is maybe a little off script, but I, I was recently struggling on the inside, if, if we can be a little transparent, being a father of four children, pastoring a church and having this fiery conviction that God's actually going to restore our state because of what he does in this region and what he does in our state is actually going to transform our nation and that that'll just tip the whole world over into this global revival. Like I actually think about and believe that kind of stuff. But, um, but I, got, I got four kids. I got a wife. I got responsibilities. Life's, life's just very full. And so what I was struggling to understand as I read the New Testament like, how does a guy in my position with the restraints I prayed for, these are the things I hungered for, the, just the responsibilities and the things that I, I've wanted, how does a guy like me in my position actually become part of that whole thing? Because the temptation is to interpret someone else's season uh, and superimpose it over yours. And it, because the New Testament, here's a little hack for you if you're in a season like mine, the New Testament was written primarily by two single men who were missionaries. And if you don't take in consideration the context of the whole Bible, you'll be tempted to think that your responsibility and the way you're reacting to that is a lesser form of obedience than Jesus and Paul. But the reality is you should read a book called uh, A Family Revision by Jeremy Pryor. The reality is, and I'm speaking to some dads, is that throughout the biblical narrative, the primary call and responsibility of a man is to make a legacy for his family is to actually make a name for their family, to take dominion as a family, to, to serve his family, to uphold his wife and break headway for them to flourish. It's, it's actually attached to family legacy. And so, but the challenge would be if I superimpose Jesus and Paul's single man missionary life over my current realm of responsibilities, I would be deeply discouraged. But the reality is that God has a season for you. He has a time for you. He has a setting for you. He has a, co uh, a context for you to flourish in, and he knows exactly what he's doing. When you plant matters and when you harvest matters, there's things in your life that are so dependent on time. And there's so much going on underneath the surface of your life, and there's growth. I want to encourage you that if the small test group that I know within this church represents the larger body of this church, you should be super encouraged. The amount of growth that's happening, the amount of hard decisions that are being made, the amount of hunger and desperation that is growing in the midst of our people should be super encouraging. But the thing that's challenging, if we're using the farmer analogy, is that so much of that is the work on the inside, isn't it? and you're swimming in the waters of a culture that is primarily rewarding external results. And so here you are, grinding away at the inner workings of God. The things that are just happening on the inside, the longings of your heart, the development of who you are, the character that's being built, walking amongst people who will never see a reward or affirm the thing that you've set your heart to because it doesn't necessarily have the external results that they're hoping for. This, to be encouraged, is what Paul's talking about to be a hardworking farmer. You give your life in ten to things that are unseen in the hope that one day it will be seen. And just a, another note here is that there's, a, there, there's this reality that when you're in a growing process, when you're in a season of a lot of stuff happening in the background, um, this, this is going to be a little discouraging, but it, it should hurt. Uh, this is something maybe that doesn't get talked enough about in Christendom, is that God wants to grow you. He wants to make you thrive and all of those things. Um, but in all that, like, it's really <laughs> painful. Uh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Give it up for Paul and the lights. Thanks, man. Uh, we're still figuring out the kinks. Uh, sometimes projectors just don't work. Oh, we got a new roof this week. That was really cool. Uh, again, something no one will ever see that cost us the more than anything we've ever else we've ever spent money on. But um, there's a new, if it rains, um, you might get wet around there because there's condensation that comes off those air conditioning units. And so just a heads up, like maybe kind of that zone kind of there is like a square sized blessing. 
<laughs> but if, you, if you're growing in God, if you're a hardworking farmer, there should be pain attached to it. There should be the reality that you feel super uncomfortable with where you are. There should be the temptation to pick yourself up and go elsewhere. There should be the temptation to believe that you are not in the right place and you're not doing the right thing because you are growing and he's pruning and he's establishing. So don't buy into the lie that you have to feel a certain way to do a certain something. I always remember what Michaela taught us, who's now our kids director. She, she said that emotions are an incredible indicator, but they are terrible dictators. The way you feel should never set the trajectory of where you go. I, I love Albert Haas. This is from that that book, he says, in times of desolation or, or growing or the crunch or the waiting, we must cling to patience. Our faith must tell us that God will supply us with sufficient grace to endure and emerge from these times. By deliberately seeking out friends and companions, we should intentionally work against desolation's inclination to become self-absorbed and isolated. Isn't that a good word? Isn't that just some wisdom? In the times of waiting, the temptation is to just give up. The time is just to isolate. The, time, the temptation is just to be discouraged because like a hardworking farmer, there's a long time before what you plant and what you reap. And it gets incredibly challenging. We've heard it said that we serve an agricultural God in a microwave world. And you must change your mind about the process of time. So farmers work with seeds, they work with seasons, but it is a worthy work. And I, I, I wanna be really clear here something, that there's a prerequisite to reward it's hard work, it's patience, it's the grind, but I don't want us to miss the fact that there is a reward. There is a reward. God is worth following. <laughs> There's blessing. I, I, I'm, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm balanced and faithful to scripture. And, but what I just get frustrated by is that most people can believe that the Bible is true, but they have a hard time believing that the Bible is true for them. So that can be true for some place in time in history, but I have a really hard time believing that that might actually be true for me. This, the, the promises can actually play out in my life, in my time, because I actually believe that God does want to bless his people. That there are unarguably rewards for those who seek God that aren't just spiritual. If you just begin reading through the book of Psalms, and another, you could read that book, Catching Fire, Becoming Flame, and and one of my practices every morning, I read five Psalms. And so uh, depending on the day of the month it is, if you want a little, little formula, what's today? It's the 25th. Um, so I'll read Psalm 25, Psalm 55, Psalm 85, Psalm 115. And then that's all, uh, Psalm 145. And so you're just adding 30. That went over your head. Okay. Um, I work, there's 150 Psalms, there's 30 days in most months. You divide that by five, you're reading through the whole Psalms in a month. There's 31 Proverbs. If you read one proverb a day, it's about that every month. Get in the Word of God in you. It just takes a few minutes, except for on the 29th of the month, because that's where Psalm 119 comes in. It's the longest book in the Bible. And uh, <laughs> so... Control freak. My life is so formulated. The time of morning I drive by the tree on Traffic Way and Branch Street in the village, every morning I hear that rooster crow in that tree. I mean, it's like clockwork. There's, my life is so predictable before my kids wake up. And that's where all that stuff, you read the book, you read the Psalms, and then the kids wake up. And we take it on. <laughs> But if you read through the Psalms, the point I was making is that you sh you'll be deeply encouraged to know that there are things that distinguish his people versus those who are not. It's a consistent theme throughout the songs that God actually blesses his inheritance. He blesses his people. He, he has good things in mind for them. He has rewards for those who set their hearts in a certain fashion. And read through Proverbs, you'll be deeply encouraged that God has a wisdom that is reserved for his people to flourish in life. You're not subject just to the suffering and the pain. It's part of the process, but God does reward those who seek him. And, and just to reinforce this idea, God so loved the world that he gave. And then it says the Son of Man came so we might have. This is nature. He gives so that we might have. It says that the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. 
James 1.17 says this, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And uh, John, I love this. Dear friends, I pray that you may enjoy good health. And it all, all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. These are promises in Scripture that I hope to receive as those who diligently seek the Lord. Just subject to suffering and pain, even though it's part of the process, I believe that the Bible isn't just true for some, but it can be true for me. Some examples in Linnea and I's life that we use from time to time. I remember when we, right before we got married, just a few weeks before I got married, the place we were living, that we were going to live, the, uh, yeah, there's the, there's the hook. Um, we had to, we had to move. And so Lene actually spent a few weeks before I got married living at my parents' house. And it's kind of this funny thing. But we found this little, and then, you know, and then again right now, you know, we, we have to move. And it seems like, just praise God, there could potentially be an outcome for us coming. And, but there's a, a scripture, Psalm 84. We took this as a promise for ourselves. Even the sparrow has found a home. Our last name's Sparrow, if you don't know us. Um, and it's not just like a place to live, like a place near God's altar. My King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. When it comes to our living situation, we have a promise in Scripture. In this one, we're, we're tithers, we're givers. And so we actually take God at his word that as you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, there's food there, says the Lord. And, and, and he'll say that he'll throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and vines from your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land. How many of you know that you can take that to the bank? We tithe, we give, we seek God. So there should be some type of reward for those who do so. You're his people. Our daughter was, was given an incurable disease when she was three months old. She was given this diagnosis that it was incurable and the only way that she could make it was through a liver transplant. But the liver transplant list is very long and it's very complex and she was dying day after day. And I just continue to confess Psalm 118, 17, that she will not die, she'll live. And she's gonna proclaim what the Lord has done. Well, there's truth in scripture. Psalm 91, when COVID first started, I've shared this story a few times and we were freaked out because of that same child is immunocompromised. And we're like, what the heck is, is, is we just all gonna die? You guys remember that? And I, I remember going to Food for Less and there's people in hazmat suits. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And, and I just remember, I have this still printed on paper in the center console of my truck. Whoever dwells in that shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge, and you want to say the Lord is a refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. You want to hear a cool story? It was, it was the first Saturday night of COVID, and we had to go film a church at home sermon, which was, I thought we were sitting there, and there was no one on the streets, and it was my dad and I and our videographer, and I literally thought we could get in trouble for doing that. I'm like, yeah, the police are going to see us, you know, and, but we got to get this stuff out, man. People need to hear the word, and so... We're like there, it's all kind of spooky. And um, at that time, it was, it was just our girls. It was just Paisley and Lily sharing a room. And we have a, a, a baby monitor in there. And um, Lene tells me after I get home, she asked how long I had been home for. I said, I, I literally just got home. She said, oh, that's crazy because not too long ago, I looked at the baby monitor and there was someone standing in the girl's room with their arms spread wide. Like, I thought you were in their room praying for them. I said, no, I was over at the estuary filming, but God must have commanded his angels concerning us to guard them in all their ways. They'll lift up their hands. So you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and serpent. Because he loves me, I will rescue him and protect him, for he acknowledges my name. 
He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Can someone say amen to the word of the Lord? And for me, I, I believe that we're actually going to see uh, revival in our day because I, I had this, this moment with Isaiah 55. It says this, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. So will that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. This is my hope, that God will do what he said he was going to do. It's going to be for the benefit of our region, for our land, that he's actually going to do it. I, I love this one. I'm just sharing with you my personal promises. Unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. And that's the Lord watches over the city. The guards stand, watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food, to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. I can rest as we build the kingdom of God. It's not up to me. It's not up to you. God protects his church. He looks after his church. We look to him. And at the end of the day, we can rest and say, this is your church. This is your people. This is your problem. And then we could go to sleep. These are good things. <laughs> so I, I don't know about you, but uh, I just believe that a farmer actually gets to an audacious faith that the seed they're putting into the ground will yield its harvest because God said so. This is farmer's work. You have to believe that there's a good outcome on the other side of your sowing. Or what's it all for? But I, wa I want to be very clear that what this reward is about. There are blessings. But you may have heard it said, and I'll say it again, that God doesn't just want to bless you. He wants to bless through you. He doesn't just want to bless your life for the sake of you being blessed. He wants to find reliable people, like Paul's talking about, that wouldn't just be blessed, but they'd be a blessing to others, that God would bless you to bless through you. And Philippians chapter 2 give us the perfect picture uh, of a, a people that have the same mindset of Christ. What does it say? Would you take on the same mind of Christ that being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage? He, he, he could have pulled the God card over and over, but then it, it, it said, but made himself a servant. He didn't use his privilege to his own advantage. He actually used the privilege and position to be a servant to other people. In, in Paul's telling the church in Philippi, take on this mindset, take on the same attitude that whatever God does to you, he can actually do through you. Whatever privilege you have, whatever opportunity you have, whatever moment you can seize, seize that moment and use that opportunity for the sake of other people. This is what it has to do with reward. And ultimately, whatever God gives us in this life, whatever thing, whatever accolade, whatever thing we earn, in our doing, it's ultimately a reward back to Jesus. And the team can come. The Bible talks about this, a crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And the Bible also talks about a crown of life. James 1, 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The Bible talks about a crown of glory, 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. 1 Corinthians talked about an imperishable crown. Not everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And so there's these crowns, there's these rewards, there's these symbols and signs of people who persevere, who endure, who give their lives in trusting Jesus. And you can be sure that as you give your life in trusting Jesus like a hardworking farmer, that there is rewards of crowns. But the Bible says in Revelation 4, it gives us a template of what happens. The 24 elders fall down before him, Jesus, who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. What's the point of a crown? It's to give it right back to Jesus. What's the point of your privilege? It's to give it right back to Jesus. 
What's the point of blessing? It's to give it right back to Jesus. So there will be a reward for your work as a farmer should receive a part of the crop. But the point of that reward is what is to give it right back to Jesus where it belongs. So we've talked about a, a soldier who doesn't get entangled in civilian affairs. These are prerequisites for someone who's reliable to carry the message of the gospel. And then an athlete, athletes don't cheat. They play according to the rules. And then Paul's like, hey, after you figure out the soldier thing, the athlete thing, there's the farmer. And the farmer should expect that through all that hard work, dedication and perseverance, there is a reward on the other side of this thing. There's something worth working for. I don't know about you, but I am motivated by something worth working for. It changes the way you wait when you know what you're waiting for. It changes the way you work when you know what you're working for. And, and I love that the way that 2 Timothy 2.7, Paul wraps up this little thought before it continues on. He just says this, hey, Timothy, just reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all this. At the end of the day, you need God's help to understand what does it look like for you to be a soldier in your context. You need God's insight and help to understand what athletic training and not bending the rules looks like for your context. For you, you need to understand the things that are worth waiting for in your life. You need to understand the seeds that are worth sowing in your life as a good, hardworking farmer. But can I just tell you that there is a reward? Can I reinforce the idea that God does reward those who diligently seek them. Can I, can I reinforce to you that parents who have children who are walking in a prodigal season, every seed that you sown, have sown and continue to speak and continue to encourage and continue to love, there is only a matter of time before God restores their life because of the seed that's been sown. For every person who's believing for healing in their family, every seed that you've sown, I want you to go to the bank with the truth that those words do not return void. There's harvest when you continue to plant. There's a reward when you continue to plant. There's a breakthrough in the heavenlies for those who continue to stand in the gap for other people. Every seed sown. The Bible says that those who sow to the Spirit will reap of the Spirit. It's an irrevocable principle. As you continue to sow the good and pleasing work of God in the world around you, there will be a harvest. There will be a reward. So, Timothy, hey, uh, the reliable people, they're, they're like soldiers. They're like athletes, but ultimately, they're farmers. They get a share in the crop when the day is done. So if you stand your feet, I, I want to pray for you. My hope is, is that you'd be able to reflect on what Paul's saying and that the Lord will give you insight into it. But what I'd imagine is a couple things. Um, is that this reality of patience is way harder said than done. <laughs> Everyone laughs because like, you can say that again. Patience is such hard work. And I just wouldn't be too crazy to think there's a whole bunch of folks in this room who have their soul attached to a promise of God and you just haven't seen it yet. You've got that family member, you've got that kid, you've got that diagnosis, whatever the thing is that you really genuinely feel like God has spoken about, you haven't seen it yet. I'd imagine at some point in that process, you've gotten tired, that you've gotten discouraged, that you've actually had the temptation to look to other sources or things that bring some sort of temporary relief because the waiting is so challenging. You're in good company. Good chance that's the story of the person next to you because waiting is hard. But when I, what I wanna pray for you today is that God would give you fresh grace for waiting. You give a, a bigger vision, a higher vision that there's things that are worth waiting for. So with eyes closed, man, if that's you, you say, I, I, uh, I need that fresh grace today. <laughs> I'm waiting and it's tiring and I'm discouraged. And there's even moments where I just feel like 
changing the play, just pivoting so I don't look so foolish to other people who know what I'm waiting for, all of those things. So if that's you, if you're, you're, you're tired and you're weary in the waiting and you need a fresh infusion of God's grace, would you just lift your hands to heaven? Come on. Actually, more than that, would you just come to the altar if you'd be so brave and bold and if you're able to, if not, just stay where you're at. But I just want to pray for you. Well, you just need a fresh infusion of the empowering grace of God to continue to wait. Continue to wait. You don't have to be embarrassed if it's like a, you're like wanting to get married, you know, you just keep waiting or whatever that, like don't, don't be shy. God has a fresh infusion of grace for you. So with eyes closed and heads bowed, if you are receiving, just hands open. Lord, we thank you. According to 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, he says, Timothy, stand strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6 says that when you've done all you can to stand, stand. So right now, I release a fresh anointing of staying power over every hungry heart. God, right now, I thank you for a fresh infusion of vision for the thing that is worth waiting for. God, we don't want to just be starters. We want to be finishers. God, we just don't want to spew empty words in the atmosphere of what God might do. God, we want to actually see it happen. So right now, for every person that's responding at the altar as a physical act of hunger, Lord, I thank you for meeting them in that place with a fresh infusion of your grace. Staying power. New encouragement. You don't have to pivot. You don't have to go elsewhere. Don't make a decision in desolation. Don't make a decision out of discouragement. Come on, see the thing through. Keep going, don't give up. And right now I take authority of every suicidal thought. Those people who thought that life is not worth living anymore because things hadn't happened on this timeline and this discouragement is too strong. And right now we release the life of Jesus to encourage every soul, every spirit. We break off a spirit of discouragement, a spirit of depression and despair and we replace it with the life-giving presence of Jesus right now. In Jesus' name. Suicidal ideologies, the, you, the way you thought it through, all of that has to go in the name of Jesus. Come on, right now, we take authority of that spirit. We cast it down. Anything that would attempt to exalt itself above the name of Jesus, we declare Jesus as King, as Lord. Your life is worth living. It's worth going on. That God has more for you. He hasn't started something not to finish something. Stay in the game. So I thank you for that fresh grace today. Grace being the empowering presence of God, the unmerited favor of God to stay. The second person I want to pray for, you guys can stay however you want to respond, but I just feel like maybe it registered with some people today when I talked about how, you know, you can believe that the Bible is true for somebody, but that can't possibly be true for me. We call that like an orphan spirit. You actually don't believe that you've legitimately been adopted in to a good father who wants to give you good things, that you're undeserving of the glorious things that God has for you, that somehow you stop believing that God is good towards you, but maybe he'll be good towards other people. If that's you, you just say, hey, I, I, I need to believe that again, that I have a good father who's adopted me and I love adoption because the reality is he didn't have to, but he wanted to. He wanted to bring you into his family. He wanted to make you his inheritance. He wanted to. He went to extreme lengths by giving his own son, Jesus. And don't you for a second think that there's anything you've done or could do that would separate you from that love that's directed towards you. You've been made worthy because of Jesus. Come on, if you just want to believe that the Bible is actually true for you, would you lift your hands? And if you're not at the altar already, would you just come forward? made you fit and he's making you fit he's made you fit he's he's made you someone who's able to be reliable 
So Lord, right now, I thank you for every promise in the scripture that is intended to be applied, not just observed. We thank you, God, for helping us to have the type of faith that believes that your word is true, not just for them, but for me. God, not so that just I can be blessed and build my empire and my name, but God, I, I want to be someone who's blessed to be a blessing. I want to be a conduit of your presence. I want to be a conduit of your glory. And in order for that to happen, the Bible must be true for you. You don't have what it takes in your own power. You don't, you're not clever enough. The Bible has to be true for you. So God, would you come and help break away any mindset that would be limiting in our belief what the Bible says about us and what you want to do through us. So right now, just with hands lifted as you receive in the front, a fresh impartation of grace. In Jesus' name. Come on, you might have a hard time receiving, but he's a good father who gives good gifts to his children. He wants to bless you today. He wants to remind you of some stuff today. Come on, just before we finish, I don't want you to leave here without receiving the good thing that God has for you. He wants to renew your mind. He wants to change your mind about some stuff. He wants to reinforce his love towards you. He wants to remind you that you are called to this. That there's a, an assignment that is on your life. That you don't have to cut it short. Come on. We believe God. That your love is directed towards it. In Jesus' name I pray. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Just before we go, let's sing. In my life, be lifted high. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope that that message was inspiring, encouraging, and hopefully equipped you for life. And if you're looking to get connected with Equippers Church, you can go to equipperscc.com slash connect, fill out a simple form, and someone from our team will be reaching out. You can find all kinds of opportunities to connect, to give, and receive prayer on our website, equipperscc.com. And hey, we really hope to meet you in person sometime, see you in the room. But until then, keep tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by... Clippers Church here on YouTube. Love you so much. God bless.